Horror Babylon Rumorg present Weird Tales Roulette. Fourteen consecutive days of weird fiction, chosen by you, the listener. See the video description for further information. The Ring by J. M. Fry, which first appeared in Weird Tales in January 1932. The magazine described the tale as a series of startling and blood-chilling happenings beset the man who wore that ancient Egyptian ring. I looked up. The man who had interrupted my gastronomic enjoyment was a tall individual, a little stooped, with a face as long as the prohibitionists in the cartoons. He had dark, hollow places under his eyes. He might have been a Canova statue for all his expression, but his features displayed deep lines as if life had given him more to worry about than most. "'You are,' he said, and mentioned my name. I told him I was. I arose and accepted his card. Arvid Hedden. It stirred a faint recollection. "'Have a chair? Thank you,' he murmured. I didn't invite him to such close intimacy, but he drew the chair from the opposite side of the table and sat down at the corner next my elbow. He didn't seem to want the people seated nearest us to hear whatever he was going to say. He leaned over to me and spoke in low tones. I take it you're interested in antiques, he said. I told him I wasn't. But, he insisted, you bought a rare ring at the Felbinger auction not two hours ago. I told him I had. What about it? Well, he hesitated, studying the tablecloth. Then he apparently changed his mind and switched off on a new line. Will you sell it to me? he inquired. I reminded him that I had just bought it. I'll give you any amount you ask. A thousand, ten thousand, a hundred th— I said no, feeling very stubborn. But think, he kept on. It isn't worth very much. A thousand dollars is a big price for it, and I'm offering you a fortune. No, I said. I won't sell it. I told him I already had more money than was good for me, but that I had never had such an unusual ring. I told him that I always had a weakness for unusual rings, and now that I had one, I was going to keep it. He hung his head for a moment. When he looked at me again, the pockets under his eyes seemed to have grown a shade darker. He caught hold of my arm. Listen, he said, I feel, or rather I know it's my duty to warn you. If you persist in wearing that— he tapped the ring on my finger. You die within twenty-four hours. I looked at him in astonishment. You mean to threaten? No, no, you misunderstand me. I mean that the ring is fatal. It brings death to whoever wears it. I laughed. Then to frighten. Don't be a fool. That's what I'm trying not to be, I said a little hotly. Oh, bother, he expostulated. See here, you've heard of such things before. Of course. I cut in. Simply myths or coincidences. He spread his hands deploringly. That's just it. That's why I hesitated about telling you this. It isn't the characteristic of educated people to be superstitious. Too bad. I think it's common sense. Have a cigar? No, thanks. Listen. Do you remember the Arvid Head and archaeological expedition that made several discoveries in the Lower Nile Valley a few years ago? I thought back and told him I guessed I did. Well, I led that party. It bore my name. We made some remarkable findings, among them the tomb of a noble in the court of Ramesses II. In a sarcophagus we found that ring. That ring, yes, sir. It's over three thousand years old. Look at it. I was looking at it. Three thousand years old. Well, well, I shouldn't have thought it and told him as much. No, I don't suppose you would have, he remarked a little dryly. Then he paradoxically added, it's never been worn very much, although plenty have worn it. It made me curious. How's that? I asked. Well, I'll tell you, he said. The ring caught my eye, and I just kept it. That's a confession. I should have turned it over to the British Museum, which supervised the expedition. But its curious design and the little history I found concerning it made it valuable as a keepsake. So I kept it. Perhaps I ought to tell you that history. It was written in the ancient sacred hieroglyphics on a 
papyrus roll I found in the sarcophagus. It wasn't long, though most ironic. This man had wished to do away with his twin brother, so he made the ring and had a curse put on it by the high priest of Amon-Ra, but then he wanted to make sure it would fit his twin brother's finger when he gave it to him, so he tried it on himself. As he did so, a bolt struck him down from the clear sky, from Ammon, the sun, as the history stated. Of course, I put no stock in this story. It was too fantastic, too mythical. I was a skeptic, as you are. I brought the ring home with me. I never wore it, because it was too small. But I gave it to my sister. He stopped to wipe a tear from the corner of his eye. She wanted it, he continued. So I gave it to her, and— that same afternoon I looked upon her dead body. She had been run down when crossing the street. There was another pause while he threw back his stooped shoulders as if to strengthen himself. Then, seeming to sag a little more in his chair, he went on. I had the ring again in my possession. I couldn't bear to see it every day. It sent chills over me. So I hid it away in a secret drawer in my desk. My brother wanted it, and I refused to give it to him. How he ever got it, I don't know because on the morning of that fatal day I had looked in the drawer to make sure it was still there. I think he must have seen me do that. He was a cocky young devil, and only laughed at what he called my whim in keeping it hidden. He was a zealous yachtsman. On this day an adverse wind switched his boom around and tossed him overboard, and when we dragged his body from the Thames, almost the first thing I noticed was this ring on his finger. They laid him on one of the docks and worked on him with a pull motor for over an hour. It was no use. In my frenzy I forgot about the ring. When later I came to look for it, it was gone. There had been quite a crowd around, and someone must have stolen it. I spent days after that, searching every pawn shop in London. I finally found one in Whitechapel where they had bought such a ring, but had sold it again. I kept my eyes on the daily papers. I investigated every violent death I found chronicled. Oh, the weary, nerve-wracking chase that ring has given me! I have done some marvellous pieces of detective work. It has led me all over Europe, and I have found in its wake only death, violent deaths ranging from accidents to suicides and murders. Man, listen to me. Only once since it was stolen off my dead brother's finger have I got as close to it as I am now. That was at Lavenue's in Paris. A young artist was wearing it. I tried to warn him, as I am warning you, but he was very rude, would not listen. He had me ejected from the place. I waited for him, and when he came out I tried to collar him again. He avoided me, ran for a moving cab. He slipped and fell under the wheels. They rushed him away before I could crowd through the jam to get near him. It wasn't until the next day that I managed to find out where he lived. I arrived there in time to learn that his relatives had sold the ring to help pay his funeral expenses. You can imagine that it has eluded me many times. There have been months when I have lost all trace of it only to pick up a clue from some tragedy that came to my notice. I was in Ostend when I got a hint that it had preceded me to New York. I arrived here only yesterday, and frantically renewed my search. This afternoon an article in the paper caught my attention. It mentioned that a certain Felbinger had fallen from his bedroom window and become impaled on a spike fence that ran close to his house. It also stated that his heirs were selling off his goods at auction. I followed what you would call my hunch, and went down there, only to find that I was too late. You were ahead of me. I got your name and your address at the Devereux Club. There they told me that you were probably dining here, so here I am. He leaned closer to me and grasped my arm again. Oh, I ask you, I beseech you not to wear that ring. Carry it in your pocket, hide it away, but don't wear it. I know what I am talking about. It has driven me almost mad. I was the means of giving it to the world, and it's up to me to get rid of it again. If you're wise, you'll destroy it. Or if you don't wish to do that, sell it to me for any price you want, and I'll destroy it. I won't toss it in the sea or hide it, but I'll grind it to powder and cast it to the wind, utterly destroy it. I casually blew a smoke ring and watched its vortical action. I thanked him for his consideration in warning me. I told him that if I decided to destroy the ring, I would give him the satisfaction of doing it and in the meantime I would be very careful. He sighed heavily, and arose. Yes, he said, I should like to have that. Satisfaction, I certainly earned it. You have my transient address. Goodbye. He was gone then, and presently I followed.
It was dark and cold outside. A drizzle was coming down, freezing as it hit the pavement. It was so slippery one could hardly walk. I hailed a taxi and directed it to the Devereux Club. As I settled back in my seat, I held up my hand to look at the ring by the passing lights. It was certainly curious. I didn't doubt but that Hedden's tale was simply the fabrication of an ingenious brain, and that he had become a little cracked over his Egyptian exploits, and the story about the ring which he had read. At least I believe the explanation would run somewhere along that line. I can't tell you just how it happened. I had been engrossed in my thoughts when, suddenly, I was aware of the tire chains grinding on the ice, and the sensation of spinning in a tub. Instantly, Arvid Hedden's warning flashed into my mind. I grasped hold of the door handle and hung on in a panic. I think that was what saved my life, for otherwise when the crash came I should surely have been thrown to the opposite side of the taxi, and that side was battered in by a streetlight standard. There were plenty of helping hands to extricate me from the wreckage. I waited there a moment to see if I was needed, but the driver wasn't hurt, and after shaking my clothes into shape and recovering my hat, I proceeded to negotiate my way on foot. I hadn't gone far, when I was passing a skyscraper that was being erected. They work on these buildings day and night. I heard a deafening crash overhead, and ducked out into the street just as a load of bricks broke through some faulty scaffolding and landed upon the sidewalk. I skated back to the curb in time to miss narrowly being struck by an oncoming car. You may suppose that my faith in our practical beliefs was just a little shaken by this time. And can you blame me for what I did? Even if you do not blame me, I blush to admit it. I took the ring off my finger and dropped it in my pocket. I felt somewhat safer as I walked on but in another block I was calling myself names for my superstitious cowardice. Was I to be frightened by a man's freakish fancy and a few narrow squeaks that seemed to corroborate it? Of course I wasn't. I was simply making a fool of myself in doubting Plato's philosophy. I pulled the ring out of my pocket and jammed it on my finger. Just then a car sped by, followed closely by another with siren going full blast, I heard the barking of automatics and instinctively ducked. It was lucky that I did, for a stray bullet bored a neat hole through the crown of my hat. With jaws tightly set, I hurried my pace. The Devereux Club was just ahead of me, and within its portals I knew I should be safe. Nothing ever happened there. Now, to me the Devereux Club was an institution embodying all the comforts a respectable loafer could wish for. Its old-fashioned architecture appealed to me, and in spite of its exclusive atmosphere, it was very homelike. It was there that I kept my bachelor quarters. I heaved a great sigh of relief as the doorman let me in. It was my haven. I felt like a mariner just getting into port after a stormy voyage. Safety was all around me. I stood for a moment in the foyer, intoxicated with it, glorying in it, drinking in the homely reek of tobacco smoke with deep breaths, and listening to the loving kisses of the billiard balls. Never shall I forget what a wonderful sense of freedom and security I had at that moment. It was an elixir for the most fatalistic constitution. I was thrilled to the marrow. With my head held high, I buoyantly took a step, tripped over a Persian rug, and sprawled headlong. My foot struck the jam of a knight's suit of armor standing inside the door. A halberd was loosened from the mailed fist, and I rolled out of the way as it cut a gash in the floor where my neck had been. I scrambled to my feet. I think that I was very red of face, and I know that I was swearing. I coarsely told the porter who rushed to my assistance that he'd better see that such menaces to life and property were banished from the Devereux Club. Yes, sir, he said he would. I told him that knights never carried such things anyway, so a halberd was particularly incongruous with that suit of armour. I brushed past him and made for the stairs. I hesitated only long enough to remove the ring from my finger— figuring that the plaster might fall off the ceiling. Has someone said that one's bedroom is one's fortress? It was in mine that at last I was able to breathe air untainted with mystery and danger. For I ask you, what could ever happen to me now? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I locked the door and sat down in my lounge chair to think matters over in a rational mood. I drew the ring from my pocket— Now that I was safe from all harm, my thoughts had dropped into a more tranquil groove. 
than the idea that a mere ring, however curiously wrought and old, could bear a fatal curse again, struck me as being beyond reason. A ring bring death? Absurd! It was inconsistent with common sense. It was all right for the ancient people of darkest Egypt, but not today. I laughed aloud. Besides, a new and pleasant suspicion dawned upon me. Perhaps, after all, the ring was a good luck charm. Of course, that was it. Why hadn't I thought of that before? Just look at the close calls I had had. And here I was, alive and uninjured. I joyously slipped it on my finger. I recalled that our civilization sometimes permitted us to believe in good luck charms, for such a superstition is not nearly so bad as a belief in curses. I twisted it round and round on my finger, reveling in the sensation of protection its influence ensured me. I read for perhaps an hour, then, feeling a little drowsy after my eventful evening, I repaired early to bed. Thinking seems to be more adapted to a reclining position and a darkened room. It was now that I began to attribute a psychological significance to my misadventures, a significance based on suggestion. Arvid Hedden had given me the suggestion. In spite of myself, it had leaked into my subconscious mind, and though my conscious mind had not believed, my subconscious had. It was a logical hypothesis, as any psychologist will tell you. I had simply unwittingly led myself into danger through Arvid Hedden's deep-planted suggestion. Strange it hadn't occurred to me before. Then, I thought that perhaps I had not yet meditated sufficiently on the suggestion of good luck to implant it on my subconscious mind, and to inhibit the evil suggestion that had been or was already there. This brought a cold sweat upon my brow. I decided to use Kui's formula to pierce the subconscious at the moment of lapsing into sleep. But what if I shouldn't succeed? It's so much easier to believe in bad luck than in good. My imagination began to prove annoying. I thought of a dozen things that might happen, the likeliest of these being the possibility of a meteorite dropping through the roof. But sure, imagination is the stuff that cowards are made of. I rolled over and concentrated on sleep. My window rattled. I leaped out of bed. It was only the wind. But what if there should be a cyclone? There are precedents even in New York. I quickly tore the ring from my finger and laid it on my dresser, and the next day I gave Arvid Hedden the satisfaction of destroying it. Was I foolish? Possibly I was, but let me finish before you judge too harshly. I said the Devereux Club was an old-fashioned affair. It still clung to combination chandeliers, even in the bedrooms. As I turned back from the dresser, I smelled a familiar, pungent odour. I instantly turned on the lights and investigated. How it happened, I don't know. The gas jet was turned on. Thank you for participating in the Weird Tales Roulette. For more information about Horror Bubble, including ways in which you can support our work, see the video description below. Until next time.